North Korea and Trump both ramping up rhetoric even beyond the president's threat of fire and fury. We'll look at whether the president's tough guy approach will get results or just make things even more tense. Then a former federal prosecutor joins us to look at the latest in the Russia probe, including the raid of Paul Manafort's home and the subpoena for his financial records. Plus, President Trump picks a fight with Mitch McConnell, then doubles down on that, too. And the Senate Majority Leader takes the bait and fights back. Why is the president taking on leaders of his own party? Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Andrew Whitman, in tonight for Richard French. President Trump doubling down on his threats to North Korea as that rogue nation makes new threats of its own. A defiant North Korea not backing down in the face of President Trump's overt military threat and the president reinforcing his promise. Frankly, uh, the people that were questioning that statement, was it too tough? Maybe it wasn't tough enough. The commander of North Korea's army making a specific threat of his own to launch missiles at the waters near the U.S. island of Guam in the near future. The U.S. territory, home to key military bases and 160,000 Americans. This missile that they're talking about has been very unreliable, and they've never launched it in salvos in multiple, so it could be a convenient uh, excuse to test the missile program further. North Korea also calling President Trump's comments a load of nonsense, saying the president is a guy bereft of reason and only absolute force can work on him. The increasingly threatening rhetoric coming as U.S. intelligence analysts now believe scientists in North Korea can produce miniature nuclear warheads that can fit inside those ICBM missiles that Kim Jong-un launched twice last month. And today, President Trump saying it's time to stand up to the rogue nation. North Korea better get their act together or they're going to be in trouble like few nations ever have been in trouble in this world. No trouble from our panel, I hope. Let's introduce them to you now. Noam Bramson, the Democratic mayor of New Rochelle, New York. Welcome back. Dominic Carter is here, political journalist and author. And on the other side of the table, former Connecticut Republican Congressman Christopher Shays. Congressman Shays is now a resident fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard Kennedy School. He's also... Was. Was. Done. Oh, okay. Well, you're out for the summer or you're out for no, good? No, no. You, you, what you... you, you ha it's a, a one-semester assignment. It's, it's the... It's awesome. I love the Peace Corps. I loved being in Congress, and I love being at, at Harvard. You were also on the Homeland Security Committee when right. you were in Congress, and you were on a Foreign Affairs Subcommittee. Uh, this, this tough... And I was chairman of the National Security Committee. And you're an all-around good guy. Thanks. Uh, this tough guy approach from President Trump to North Korea, is there... Can you recall a similar experience from an American president, and is there a chance that this could actually work? Um, it only works <laughs> if you do what you say. And if you, you say things that you don't ultimately do, then it doesn't amount to anything. And we've already seen a little bit of that because the other day, President Trump threatened North Korea and said, don't threaten us anymore. North Korea threatened Guam, and then he came back today and said, don't threaten us anymore. Right. I mean, at some point, he's going to have to take action. Well, okay, let's, let's realize, though, a lot of administrations, Republican and Democratic administrations, have failed with North Korea. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought that he wasn't developing his nuclear arsenal and found that he was and, um, under the Clinton administration. And the Bush administration didn't do much, if anything, and uh, we're not doing much now. So um, it's a scary thing, frankly. It's scary because uh, we have a president who's irrational, I think, and uh, I think that leader is irrational in Korea, too. Uh, yeah, for a second, I wasn't sure which leader you were talking about. <laughs> How do you, what's your take on this tough guy approach? Let, let me draw upon my immense foreign policy experience <laughs> as, the, as the mayor of Rochelle uh, to, to largely agree w w with Chris. And in my mind, this is not about tough or weak. This is about smart or stupid. Good and point. To, to make statements that could have been written by the North Korea propaganda ministry without prior consultation with your secretary of defense or secretary of state, without any ability to make good on the threat, mm. except by launching a, a preemptive nuclear strike, which would be horrific for uh, both Koreas and for the world, um, that is not the way to conduct foreign policy. And I look at this and I think those of us who are concerned about Donald Trump being president, we're worried about three things. One, that he would pursue ruinous public policy, and he's validated that over the last six months. Two, that he would threaten our democratic institutions, and he's validated that fear as well. And three, that when faced with a kind of crisis that every president has to face, 
He would act in a way that is impulsive and erratic without a sense of history or context, and that is playing out right now, and it scares the living daylights out of me. We were, we were talking about this after the first chapter, the first round of threats from President Trump on Tuesday, and Dominic made a point that I agreed with to a point, but I didn't want to go all in because it, it you mean seemed... You agreed with Dominic? I did, I did. <laughs> but it, but it, seemed, it seemed like it would be beyond the pale, it would be wag the dog uh, territory here. You claimed that you think his threats against North Korea are a distraction. A distraction I, from, I, before you get, I disagreed to an extent, but then I heard this clip from Trump advisor Sebastian Gorka, who was making a historical reference. Let's play that clip. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, we stood behind JFK. This is analogous to the Cuban Missile Crisis. We need to come together, and anybody, whether they're a member of Congress, whether they're a journalist, if you think that your party politics, your ideology trumps the national security of America, that's an indictment of you. Okay, the, comparing it to the Cuban Missile Crisis, to me strikes it as, look at how presidential Trump is being, because that's such a classic moment of presidential behavior from the Cuban Missile Crisis. JFK called President Eisenhower, his predecessor in the office, to get his input. Is the, I mean, what's your take when you hear that clip, and, and does that add credence to your argument that this is all a distraction? With all due respect, I don't even have to hear the clip. And it's not, I think it's a distraction. I know it's a distraction. To know Donald Trump is to know he's always trying to dictate the terms of how he is seen publicly. So, Put yourself in, in his shoes. You've got two narratives here. And I agree with everything that's been said by the congressman and, and the mayor. I could not have said it better. You, you have two narratives here. Headline number one that can dominate the papers, the Washington Post and New York Times, for the next couple of weeks, Manafort home raided. Trump under investigation. How far are these investigations going to go? Will there be indictments? Who will be indicted? Will the president's son be indicted? That's one side. Or option B, uh, American presidents do well with public polling at time of war. And so if you come off looking weak investigation or strong standing up to the regime in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, North Korea, mm -hmm. Which one would you rather have? I would rather have the one that makes me put me in the best light. So that's why I say I know. But to the congressman's point, and I do note this is a fellow Republican stating this, to the congressman's point, at some point, empty words have to add up or, or, or you're, you're made to, to, to be a laughing stock of the world. Well, it's even more dangerous because then they're not going to believe it when you have to. In other words, when a president says he won't use force, um, then he's taking that off the table. So force is out there as a viable, but you don't say we're going to blow you to kingdom come. <laughs> what about what about Dominic's point that this might be a distraction from other I headlines? I totally agree with him. Really? Yeah, totally agree with him. I, I, I didn't before you spoke. I didn't even think about it. But it is a huge distraction. And it's not like Clinton sending cruise missiles into Sudan when he was under investigation and so on. It's, the, uh, the last example of that that I can think of, and, and it's debatable, was the invasion of Grenada from President Reagan. Because we had just gone through the, the bombing of the, mil of the Marine base in Beirut. And a lot of people thought that the invasion of Grenada was a distraction from that. That's different. Grenada was such a weak enemy. We... We yeah, it overran was a the country in 10 minutes. Yeah, it was a weak enemy, but they didn't want it to become a Cuba. And, right. And, and, and but, we this didn't, is, yeah. but this is much different because we don't know the capabilities and the actions of oh, the... Oh, I think this is totally different. I, I totally agree with you. I think, I think uh, Trump has, wants this to be the topic and not anything else. And you can't blame him, actually. Obviously, no one can know for sure what's going on mm -hmm. in his mind and the mind of his, his close advisors. But I will say this. In no prior administration, Democrat or Republican, I may have disagreed with the use of force in particular instances, but I never would think for a moment that the president who committed American troops did so without believing in his heart that it was the right thing to do and in the national interest to do so. And I don't have that confidence for this administration, which is uh, a very troubling thing for me as an American. That, that brings up a, a good point, because I, I read a column from E.J. Dion in the Washington Post this morning that basically said, this is another opportunity for bipartisanship from this president that's been missed. Yes. Uh, normally, an international crisis like this, Congressman, you would talk to 
leadership of both parties. Absolutely. I mean, how far of a departure from the norms from when you were in Congress? And you, you were in Congress not too long ago. You know what? It, it, there's so many departures. I, since 2010, 70 percent of the members have been elected, and none of them know how to work with the other side. And, and so uh, you have a president who doesn't know how to work with the other side. And, and you're totally right. You would call the speaker, you would call minority leaders in the House and the Senate, uh, and the majority leaders. Uh, you would have a consensus, and they would all be there ready to support you. And they would know what you were going to do. Dominic, we saw the president take military action against Syria. He sent in cruise missiles. It was all from afar. This is a much different animal because it's nuclear, or it has the potential to be nuclear. How, how much does the country need to hear in a more bipartisan fashion, in a way that people feel assured that this is what needs to happen bef before he can take any action against North Korea? Well, I, I think that um, the problem that we're all dealing with as, a, as Americans is there's a reason why we have a president of the United States and a secretary of state and, and, and so many people inside an administration. But what's going on right now, Andrew, is we have a president, for, for better or worse, that just shoots from the hip or it, on everything. And it would be nice if we, why not just pull, to the mayor's point, uh, what I believe he was alluding to, why not just pull back and let your secretary of state run lead on this until it's necessary for you to come in. And when you come in, be serious with what you have to say. We're dealing with a game of a high stakes game of nuclear war with a madman in North Korea and a president here that some could say is coming off as John Wayne. I mean, it, it just defies logic. I mean, this is not an original observation, but what he's doing is the reverse of Teddy Roosevelt. He's speaking loudly and carrying a small stick because he's largely making threats he can't make good on. Uh, oh, that's and a it's good an, analogy. Yeah. And it's a good and, analogy. It's, it's a, I, I'm going to steal that when I'm on your other program. Yeah. <laughs> Congressman, what do you think the rest of the world, particularly countries that could be our enemy or look at us with suspicion at best, what are they looking at in the, in the standoff with North Korea? Well, first off, the folks in the Middle East like us. Uh, because uh, we're not focused on democracy anymore. We're not looking for regime, regime changes. A and, and they think uh, he will uh, honor his word to them. So, uh, so it depends what parts of the world. I think Europeans have big concerns about him. But, but if there are other nations that we might, I mean, Iran is clearly in the president's crosshairs. He talked about them again today. Uh, if there is a, a country that has a, a somewhat adversarial relationship with the United States. I think States, they, uh, they want to, they haven't figured them out yet. And, I mean, and, and how much will they learn from how this North Korea situation plays out? Um, it depends. Um, it depends where it goes. So, I mean, the, the point is North Korea could go in a hundred different, uh, many different directions mm. and uh, we'll all learn. All right. We will take our first break. When we come back, the Russia probe expanding after Paul Manafort's home is raided by the FBI and the feds demand his banking records. The White House not taking too kindly to it all. How they're responding and what this means for the investigation, next. <laughs> 